In this video, we're going over the category aromatic substances that open the orifices. Now, this is a small category, and it's kind of a weird category because you may or may not actually use these herbs in practice, but for the sake of TCM theory, we'll go over it anyway. And there are handouts and flashcards if you want to download them. There are links below. Let's go ahead and get started. And this video is brought to you by the TCM Study Single Herb Review Course. If you're studying for a big test like finals, year ends, or boards, and you want to study all of the herbs in a very quick and efficient manner, then the Single Herb Review Course might be for you. If you want to learn more, stick around to the end of the video. All right, so aromatic substances that open the orifices. What do we mean by aromatic substances that open the orifices? Well, kind of the short answer here is, if you remember in the last category, we had substances that calm the spirit. And there we were talking about more mild Shen problems, things like insomnia, anxiety, irritability, palpitations. We considered those Shen disturbance, but they were more mild Shen disturbance. Here with aromatic substances that open the orifices, we're dealing with more severe Shen disturbance, things like delirium or unconsciousness or even coma. So those we would consider more severe Shen problems. And so we're using these aromatic substances to open the orifices and awaken the spirit and revive consciousness. So this is maybe kind of like when we um, when we're in acupuncture, we talk about using the Jing Well points to revive consciousness, or using Do Twenty Six to revive consciousness. Well, here we're doing the same sort of thing, but we're just using the aromatic quality of these herbs to open up the sensory orifices and revive the spirit. And so you can kind of think of this as maybe uh, kind of the old timey version of this would be smelling salts. I think these are actually based on ammonia, but this is like back in the day, if you were, if you had fainted or someone was feeling woozy and feeling like they were going to faint, you could give them some smelling salts and that strong aroma, that strong smell would open up their orifices and wake them back up and either wake them up from fainting or prevent them from fainting. And I think Later, they did kind of the same thing like with boxers. If you were in a boxing ring and the boxer was starting to get punch drunk and they were starting to get woozy, they would give them some smelling salts to wake them back up, bring them back to their senses, bring their consciousness back to the forefront. And so they would be more um, awake and aware and able to interact with the outside world. And so here we're doing the same things with these earths. These are substances that have a very strong smell, a very strong aroma, and that aroma opens up the sensory orifices and awakens the spirit. So that's kind of the short answer of what we're talking about here is before we were talking about more mild Shen problems like irritability, insomnia, anxiety, here we're talking severe Shen problems like delirium, unconsciousness, and coma. So this is Future Me here and something that I wanted to point out but I forgot to mention is we do have two different categories with aromatic in the name. We have aromatic herbs that transform dampness, and then this one, aromatic substances that open the orifices. So with aromatic herbs that transform dampness, they were using the aromatic property to awaken the spleen so that it can perform its function of transforming dampness. So they were dealing more with middle jowl issues. But in this category, we're still using the aromatic property, but we're using the aromatic property to awaken the spirit and open the sensory orifices. So that's kind of the difference and don't get those two confused. But if we want to go a little bit more into it, here we can talk about some interesting theory and we're going to borrow some terminology from Wiseman and Wiseman and Brand's Concise Materia Medica to kind of explain a little bit more what we mean by Shen disturbance and opening the orifices. So let's come back to what we mean by this term Shen. We talked about this a little bit in the last category, but here uh, this is a quote from Wiseman and Brand where he say, In Chinese medicine, the spirit, also called the heart spirit, is an entity that dwells in the heart and is the part of us that experiences consciousness. So that's kind of something we said before about there's this thing where we say Shen, we can mean a lot of different things, but here we're talking about our ability to experience consciousness. And I think there's another good uh, definition in Wang Juyi's book, Applied Channel Theory. So it turns out in the Neijing, sometimes we say Shen, or sometimes it uses the term Shen Ming, or spirit brightness. So in that Wang Juyi Applied Channel Theory book, he, des he describes Shen uh, spirit brightness as our ability to interact intelligently with the external environment. So our ability to perceive and interact 
uh, with the outside world. And so that kind of gives us some hint about what we mean by Shen disturbance as well. So like a severe example of Shen disturbance is a person is in a coma, that they're still alive, they're still breathing, but they have no interaction with their external environment. You can call their name, you can poke them in the foot, you can try to tickle them, but they have absolutely no response. Uh, maybe a step below that is somebody who is delirious, they're experiencing shock, or they're just kind of not there, that again, they're awake, they're moving around, their eyes are moving, but if you try to get their attention, if you snap their fingers, they're just not there. That could be like, there's some sort of Shen disturbance. Um, so that's what we're talking about here with this, with the spirit or the Shen. We could describe this as the part of us that experiences consciousness or the part of us that can interact intelligently with our external environment. So when it comes to Shen disturbance, we have two levels. I say mild Shen disturbance versus more severe Shen disturbance. But if we borrow the Wiseman and Brand term, he talks about disquieted heart spirit. So this is what we talked about in the last category, palpitations, insomnia, profuse dreaming or dream disturbed sleep, heart vexation. That would just mean more that the spirit is uneasy, it's disquieted, the spirit can't come home to its abode in the heart, so we get this disquieted heart spirit. More severe Shen problems would be what we call clouded spirit. So here we're talking about impaired consciousness, such as stupor or coma, that this is the, the Shen is clouded. So we start to lose our ability to interact intelligently with the outside world or our external environment. So in this category, we are not dealing with disquieted heart spirit. Disquieted heart spirit is something that we dealt with in the previous category, substances that calm the spirit. Here we're dealing with clouded spirit, these more severe Shen problems like impaired consciousness, such as stupor, delirium, coma. So that's, that's a little background on what we mean by Shen. And then kind of to take a detour here before we get into the herbs is we can talk about what do we mean by opening the orifices? Which orifices are we talking about? Because at least when I was in school, to me this was a little bit confusing because I feel like we, we say different things. Sometimes we talk about the sensory orifices like eyes, ears, nose, mouth. Um, but then sometimes people will use the term heart orifices, or sometimes they'll even say the portals of the heart, like when we talk about phlegm misting the heart orifices or phlegm veiling the portals of the heart, and you're kind of like, what do we mean by heart orifices? Are we talking about like the valves or the opening into the atrium? What do we mean by there? So let's say something about what do we mean by orifices? So really, uh, in, in general, we can, again, this is coming from Wiseman and Brand, orifices are openings in the body or points of contact with the outside world. So between the internal body, like our physical internal body, or our mental consciousness internal body, points of contact between the internal environment and the external environment. So here when we say orifices, sometimes we could divide this into two categories. We have the clear orifices, which are the eyes, nose, ears, mouth, and tongue. These are ways where physical substances enter the body or information enters the body. And then we also talk about the turbid orifices, so the anal and genital openings. Sometimes we say the lower yin orifices, or we'll say the anterior and posterior yin orifices to refer to those orifices. So here, we're not really talking about the turbid orifices of the, the anal and genital openings. We're talking about the clear orifices or the sensory orifices. Now here again, this is kind of weird because sometimes we, we say the sensory orifices and sometimes we say the heart orifices. What do we mean by heart orifices? Well, technically when we talk about these clear orifices, we say that each one is associated with one of the organs. So we can say the liver goes to the eyes, the lung goes to the nose, opens to the nose, the, um, the kidney goes to the ears, the spleen goes to the mouth, and so on. So technically each one of these orifices is governed by a particular organ. But in some sense, we can say that because the heart houses the Shen, and the Shen is like the emperor of the entire body, we could say that all of these clear orifices 
are actually governed by the heart. It's not just that the heart goes to the tongue, sprouts in the tongue. We could say that to some extent, the heart governs all of the clear orifices because the heart houses the Shen, the Shen is our consciousness, and so we have this information coming in through these sensory orifices, and it's up to our heart to interpret and make sense of that information and um, interact with the outside world on the basis of that um, information. So it's kind of like when we say the heart orifices or the portals of the heart, we're kind of talking about that go-between between the external world and our internal environment, either our physical internal environment or our mental, emotional, consciousness, external environment. So here, uh, from again from Wiseman, we say, in the term opening the orifices, the word orifices refers not to the tongue, which is the uh, where the heart sprouts in the tongue. The word orifices refers not to the tongue, but metaphorically to the interface between the spirit and the outside world, understood as being the sum of all the clear orifices. So when we talk about these severe Shen problems or clouded spirit, that's what we're talking about is this interface between the spirit and the outside world is blocked. Um, either there's a pathogen or something else blocking our ability to interact intelligently with the external environment. And so the way we deal with that is we open the orifices to restore that interface between our internal world and external world. So that's what we're doing in this category. So when it comes to clouded spirit, here we're getting a, like a, a little bit more detailed where this is kind of like an onion that we're uncovering the, the layers. Here we're getting to the next layer. So here we're talking about clouded spirit. These are these severe Shen problems of delirium, unconsciousness, and coma. That's what we're treating in this category. When it comes to these severe Shen problems or clouded spirit, we generally have two types. We can say we have open disorders, or we also call them desertion patterns or we have closed disorders, or we call them block patterns. So we look at open disorders. This is um, unconsciousness with a relaxed body. Um, the, the muscles are loose, they're not tense. Uh, we can see things like spontaneous sweating, uncontrolled urination, closed eyes, and open mouth. So these are things like the, the fluids and the chi are leaking out um, because we have this open disorder where things are allowed to leak out. Things the chi and the yang are deserting the body. And so this is generally associated with deficiency patterns where they, because there's deficiency, things are open, they're leaking out, and the chi and yang are deserting. Contrast to that are closed disorders, or what we call block patterns. And here we'll see things like unconsciousness, coma, or delirium with whole body rigidity. So instead of being relaxed and flaccid, we're really tight and rigid. We can see tight mouth, clenched fist, uh, muscle rigidity. Both the eyes and the mouth are closed. Things are closed up tight. And this uh, has more to do with excess patterns. This is caused by an excess pattern where an excess pathogen is blocking things. So here, when I was in school, my, my Chinese teacher said that the difference between these two when we say open and closed patterns is you look at the eye, uh, you look at the mouth. And in both cases, the eyes are closed, but the mouth is open. And that's why we say open disorder and closed disorder. Now, I'm not going to disagree with him. Uh, he's a very smart man. I'm not, I'm not going to say, I think that's, that's one way to interpret it. The way I look at this is when we say open and closed, we're, we're not really talking about necessarily the eyes or the mouth. We're talking about the sensory orifices or the orifices of the heart. That in the case of open disorders or desertion patterns, the heart orifices are open. So your chi, your yang, and your fluids are leaking out. There's deficiency here. Because there's deficiency, everything's wide open and your stuff is deserting you and leaking out. That's what we mean by open disorder. When we say closed disorder, that's because of an excess pattern. Things are, your heart orifices are closed, your heart portals are closed or blocked, and that's blocking this interface between your internal environment and your external world. That's why we say closed or blocked. It's your heart orifices are closed. Your sensory orifices are blocked by an excess pathogen, usually either heat, cold, or phlegm. There's phlegm blocking your interface between the internal world and the external world. So that's why I mean by closed disorders or block patterns. So it turns out in this category, we are not dealing with open disorders. We are not dealing with desertion patterns. That's something we more talked about with herbs like 
Futsa and uh, Ganjiang and um, Ren Shen. Those were treating desertion patterns or Tuo syndrome, or we had maybe similar symptoms like unconsciousness or coma, a person going into shock, but that was due to deficiency where everything is open and leaking out. So we use herbs like Futsa and Ren Shen to strongly tonify Yang and strongly tonify Qi. In this category, what we're treating is closed disorders or block patterns, where there's an excess pathogen blocking the sensory orifices. So we use aromatic substances to open up those orifices and awaken the spirit. So that's an important thing to, that we're talking about here. We're not just talking about any type of unconsciousness or any type of Shen problems. We're specifically talking about closed disorders and block patterns. So going a level deeper, it turns out when we talk about closed disorders, we also have two type of closed disorders. We have hot closed disorders and cold closed disorders. So with hot closed disorders, we'll see things like irritability, convulsions, red face, heavy breathing, yellow tongue coat, rapid pulse. Hopefully this makes sense. These are all signs of heat, that irritability, red, red face, heat turns things red. You, you have heat, so you're hot and bothered. It's disturbing the Shen. Uh, yellow, yellow tongue coat, yellow is the color of heat and a rapid pulse. Heat causes the pulse to speed up. And this is usually due to either warm diseases entering the nutritive level. So examples, Western examples of this would be like meningitis, encephalitis, severe pneumonia, the toxic stage of infections. I think about when you go into like septic shock because of an infection. Um, but severe warm diseases entering the deeper levels of body, or sometimes we say heat enters the pericardium level, even in Chang Han Lun, when we get to the Jue Yin stage, even though it's cold damage, it eventually turns into heat and you get heat entering the pericardium, disturbing the spirit, causing, causing these problems. Or you could say this is heat stroke, end stage liver disease, or certain cerebrovascular accidents like having a stroke. But we can also have cold closed disorder. So things like an ashen or cyanotic face. So again, when you're cold, you're pale or you're blue. A cold body, a white tongue coat, and a slow pulse. Cold causes things to slow down. Um, this can also come with sudden collapse or foaming at the mouth. And this is usually due with, um, uh, has to do with coma associated with cerebrovascular accidents or poisoning. So when we get into this category, this is something that we'll want to differentiate between that. Um, these herbs are treating closed disorder, but some of these herbs are better for hot closed disorder, and some of these herbs are better for cold closed disorder. So that's what we're dealing with in this category. And so we have this slide. This is the slide in the uh, notes, and this is just summarizing what we talked about, that these herbs are treating um, closed syndrome. So we're not, we're not dealing with open syndrome or desertion patterns, that we're using more herbs like Utsa, Ganjiang, Ren Shen. We're treating this closed, closed disorder or block patterns, and we have two types, hot and cold. So when we get into the properties of these herbs, again, we call these aromatic substances that open the orifices because here we use the word substances because we're not dealing with plant parts. We're dealing more with uh, minerals and other non-plant parts. Actually, a lot of them are like saps that have hardened. So that's why they say aromatic substances that open the orifices, because generally speaking, they're not uh, leaves, twigs, or roots. The taste here is going to be acrid or aromatic. Of course, it's aromatic because it's in the name of the category. We're using that aromatic property to open, uh, open the orifices, but also awaken the spirit. So we said the aromatic property has an uh, opening and awakening effect. Here, instead of saying awaken the spleen, we're saying awakening the spirit. Acrid, because again, we have an excess pathogen blocking the heart orifices, blocking the portals of the heart. So we use the acrid flavor to disperse that pathogen. So we're using those two flavors together. Temperature, in general, they're warm, but there are going to be some that are cold in temperature. Again, depending on whether we're uh, treating a hot closed disorder or a cold closed disorder. Entering channels tend to be the heart and the spleen. Of course, they enter the heart because we're opening the orifices of the heart. Uh, we also say the spleen. I'm not sure most of these herbs don't have a big effect on the spleen itself. I think we just say the spleen because the spleen is associated with the aromatic property. So I think that's the only reason we say spleen, but many of them do enter the spleen, but they don't necessarily have an effect on digestion or anything like that. 
In terms of cautions or contraindications, number one, do not use these for abandonment or desertion patterns. So like, like we said, these are for closed patterns where there's an excess pathogen blocking the orifices. So it's, this is not just for any old condition of a person being unconsciousness or having impaired consciousness. Consciousness. If we use this for a desertion pattern, you would make the patient so much worse. So this is only when we have excess pathogens blocking, so we call them um, closed syndromes or block patterns. Number two, these are scattering herbs that can very easily drain chi, so only use them for short periods of time. So again, we're using the aromatic to open things up. We're using the acrid to very quickly scatter these pathogens that are blocking our orifices. So if we use them long term, we'll just end up scattering our upright chi, so that's not a good thing. And then a lot of these, we say it's either use caution during pregnancy or more likely contraindicated during pregnancy. And so on the one hand, we could think of this as this very strong scattering nature that would scatter things, or this is maybe kind of weird, but um, one of the ways I think about it is because we're saying open the orifices. And so when you say orifices, we technically mean the clear orifices, the sensory orifices that are up in the head. But I just think about like, Maybe you're also treating the lower orifices as well, and so if you open the lower orifices, the baby will just fall right out. So that's something you want to be careful of when you're dealing with herbs that open the orifices. Main action here is to open the orifices and awaken the spirit, so we're tre treating things like impaired consciousness, delirium, impaired consciousness, coma. And some other things is that because these are substances, we're pretty much always taking them in pill or powder form. You don't really decoct these. And so this is another thing where some people would ask, like, if a person is unconscious, how would you even give them these herbs? And I'm assuming that if you were to give them herbs in this situation or historically when they did it, what it is is they already had these pills and they would just shove them down your throat and, like, make you swallow them even though you weren't conscious. So it's kind of like if, if somebody... If somebody suddenly falls on consciousness and is foaming at the mouth, number one, you don't want to take the time to have to prepare a decoction. It's like, oh, like wait here for 90 minutes while I go boil some herbs and hopefully you're still alive when I get back. It's more like you would have these on hand in pill or powder form, uh, kind of like as part of your first, your emergency kit, and then you would just force them to swallow them. Um, but these are, because they're substances, we're usually not decocting them. We take them in pill or powder form. And then when if we were to use these in practice, we would want to combine them with other herbs, depending on which pathogen is blocking the, the orifices. So if we have uh, an excess heat pathogen blocking the orifices, we would combine them with herbs that clear heat, like especially herbs that treat heat toxicity. If we had a, a cold pathogen blocking the orifices, then we would combine it with herbs that warm the interior and disperse cold. If we had phlegm blocking the orifices, phlegm heat or phlegm cold, we would combine it with herbs that transform phlegm. So it's kind of like these aromatic ones are treating the branch symptoms of opening up the orifices, but we'd still combine it with other herbs that treat that underlying pathogen. So kind of something I, I meant to mention in the beginning is, again, this is something that we learn for the purposes of theory, but in real life, you would probably be very unlikely to use these herbs in practice. Because same thing when we talk about acupuncture with a Jingwell points or D26, I know that everybody likes to have this fantasy where they're like, where you're on an airplane and they say, is there a doctor on board? And you think you can rush to the rescue and press D26 and revive a person from consciousness. In the real world, it doesn't work like that. In the real world, if someone is unconscious, call 911. If there's someone who's passed out, do not stick needles in them without their consent. That's a very important part of being a modern modern medical practitioner is you only treat people with their consent. You're not you're not like an ambulance driver where you can do that. Only it's if you want to stick needles in someone, you need their consent first. If you're going to administer herbs, you need their consent first. Obviously, if they're unconscious, they are unable to consent. So so don't do acupuncture on people who are unconscious. Don't give herbs to people who are unconscious. So it might be very unlikely that you would prescribe these herbs uh, in your clinic. Number one, just if people are having these severe problems, you would probably, that's a red flag and you would refer them out. Number two, if they are having uh, serious uh, 
impaired consciousness or disturbed consciousness, even if they're like delirious or not there, you still should not give them herbs without their consent. So some of these herbs we will use in other contexts, but by and large, you may or may not use, actually use these herbs. And I think that's part of the reason they tend to be not on the NCCM herb list. So these are our herbs. It's kind of a short category. And again, you may not actually have access to all of these herbs. Uh, you may only actually ever use one or two of them in practice. And when I was in school, we only had a couple of these in our uh, student clinic. I think some of these you, you won't even see in your clinic. But for the, for, the sake of, for the sake of TCM theory, let's go ahead and go over them. So our first one is Shi Xiang Moscus. Shi Xiang Moscus. This is deer musk or the secretions, the navel secretions from the musk deer. So I think this isn't just any old deer. This is a specific species of deer called the musk deer and you're getting the secretions from it. So this one, I believe this animal is partially endangered and even if it's not, it's very expensive to get. So it's very unlikely that we would have access to it. But in terms of TCM theory, we say that Shu Xiang opens the orifices and revives the spirit. And this can be used for either hot, dis hot closed disorder or cold closed disorders. So this might be things like heat enter the heat entering the pericardium during a warm disease. So again, when we talk about uh, pathogens coming into the body, um, it enters through different levels and Technically, the heart is the is the final level, but it's like if a, if a pathogen gets to the heart, that means you're dead. The heart is the emperor. If the pathogen gets that deep, that means you are dead. So the one just above that is the pericardium or the heart wrapper, xin bao, or the heart protector. So that it's kind of like your pericardium is your last line of defense before, before the pathogen gets into the heart. And so that's something we'll see in like... Uh, uh, late stage Juayin syndrome or when a heat pathogen uh, gets deep in the body. So heat entering the pericardium, you might see things like convulsion, delirium, stupor, fainting, tetonic collapse. So I think that's that rigidity or phlegm heat clouding the heart orifices uh, and things like seizure. So when we have phlegm conditions, we get some, some of the, like the, the seizure conditions too. So that's what we're talking about with Shushyang. It has a very strong aromatic property that opens that up for both hot closed disorders and cold closed disorders. Shushyang also has an action of invigorating blood and alleviating pain because it's acrid and dispersing. So we can use it things for like fixed palpable masses or amenorrhea due to blood stasis, heat toxicity related swelling, sores, carbuncles, sore throat, injury and trauma or B syndrome. Again, this is very hard to get. If you were to get it, it's stupidly expensive. So it's probably unlikely that you would use it for this. And then we also say it hastens delivery for difficult delivery, dead fetus or retained placenta. So either you want, you're at the stage where you want to induce labor or um, there's still stuff in there that you want to get out, like a stillborn that you need to uh, expel or retain placenta or other things like that. So on the one hand, it's like we could use this to hasten delivery, but what would you really mean by that is it's contraindicated during pregnancy when you don't want the baby to come out, don't use shush yang. So that's what we mean is uh, it's contraindicated during pregnancy. So we say shush yang is the navel gland secretions of the musk deer. So again, this, is a, this isn't just any old deer that you run into on the road or, you know, and I'm from the Midwest, we have a lot of deer and, uh, they, they tend to go in the field and eat the corn. So that's kind of that's kind of a joke about the, well, the people who hunt deer. They say, like, you can say they're wild deer, but really we have corn-fed deer in Illinois because they're, they're really just there eating the corn out of your field. But this isn't any old deer. This is a specific species of musk deer. And in school, I knew, I knew a person who was really into, like, perfume and stuff, and he said that this is actually used as the, uh, or traditionally was used as the base for a lot of, um, perfumes, clones, and fragrances. So it's like you would start with with this musk and then add other scents on top of it. Um, so maybe that's something you can think about that this deer musk was used in perfume. So it obviously has a very fragrant scent, a very strong smell. But like we said, this particular species of deer, I think is it's either endangered or protected. It's something that it's very hard to get. So I think there are some sources where it's okay to farm it. It's not necessarily illegal that if it comes from the farmed musk deer, you can get it. But if you were to get it, it's stupidly expensive. And so you 
you probably wouldn't use it in any way because if someone is dealing with a situation of convulsion, delirium, stupor, and tetonic collapse, you should probably just call 911. Or I guess, is it 999 in Europe? You should, you should call emergency services and not think about like, oh, I need to go get some navel secretions of a musk deer. So that's Shushiang, used for both hot and closed disorders. Notice that the dosage is very small, like 0.03 to 0.1 grams. And again, it's like, I think you have to kill like several deer just to get a small amount. So it's, it's very expensive anyway, so you wouldn't use a lot. And you would use this in pill or powder form instead of decocting it, but it has a very small dosage, like most of the herbs in this category. And then Shi uh, Xiang Shi, I believe, just refers to the species of this deer. And Xiang is something we'll see quite commonly. Xiang means aromatic. And so that's, it's deer aroma uh, for Shi Xiang. So that's Shi Xiang, use for both hot and closed disorders. It can also invigorate blood. And it uh, hastens delivery, which means it's contraindicated during pregnancy. Next is Bing Pian Borneolum. Bing Pian Borneolum. And this is... Borneol. I, I guess some people know what that is. I don't know what it is. Um, apparently in its natural form, this is um, some sort of tree secretion like a sap. I don't remember if it's from the body of the tree or the leaf of the tree. I think we have a couple different species. Some it's called a uh, dragon brain and it comes from the, the trunk of a, of a dragon tree. I think there's another type that's actually comes from the leaves and stems. So it's some sort of sap from a plant. It's very similar to camphor. I think even the um, the the not natural. What's the what's the word I'm looking for? Synthetic. The synthetic version of this is actually made with camphor and turpentine and other things. So there's a natural and a synthetic. The natural is better but more expensive. The synthetic is cheaper but not as good. But anyway, it's a tree sap that is dried and then they grind it up into a little white powder. And it's very, and it's again very fragrant. So this one opens the orifices and revives the spirit for impaired consciousness, various types of fainting and convulsions. So this one again, even though we say it's mildly cold in temperature, I think we use it for both uh, hot closed disorders and cold closed disorders, depending on the combination. But it has that very strong fragrance that opens and awakens the spirit. You can also say it clears heat and relieves pain. So it can be applied topically for painful swollen throat, mouth sores, red swollen painful eyes, heat toxicity related sores like boil sores, carbuncles, and sores that fail to close. So I think this is one that when I was in school, we had it in our clinic. And I think that if you were to see it used, it would be used for this topical application. So when we talk about those different substances that regenerate flesh or help things heal, sometimes you'll add in some Bing Pien because it can help with that. I think, B, I think Bing, Bing Pien does have the potential to cause some skin irritation. So you want to be careful with it. But if we were to use it in modern practice, it's probably being used for this application, not for fainting and convulsions. Again, if a person is fainting and convulsion and convulsing, send them to the hospital. Don't try to make a pill out of Bing Pien. So this one, we say use caution during pregnancy or it's contraindicated during pregnancy. So different books will say different things. I think Bensky says caution. Um, other books like Wiseman and Brand say contraindicated during pregnancy. So either one, I would just say contraindicated to be safe. And it also says do not expose to heat. And I actually don't remember why. I'm not sure if that like either lessens its effect because a lot of times we say aromatic things, the heat destroys the aromatic property. So I'm not sure if it's that or sometimes when you heat things up, it creates toxic things. So I'm, I'm actually, I don't remember which one it is. I'm sorry, but it does say do not expose to heat. And so that's why we say we use it in uh, pills or powders. We don't use it in decoction. And again, the dosage is very, very small, like 0.01 to 0.3 grams. So if you're using this, you need to get a really good scale. You need to get like a I remember one time I, I wanted to get a scale that was more accurate. I just had a kitchen scale that measured grams. And so it was really hard to be accurate because it was just to the nearest whole number. 
And so I something what I so I asked my aunt who was a biology teacher and she made some comment like, "Oh yeah, that's really easy to get because I'm a science teacher. I like I, I have access to it." And then I realized what she meant was it's like usually only drug dealers are buying scales uh, with that kind of calibration. So I would say like get you want you want the you want the drug dealer type of scale that's measuring small amounts or the chemist type of scale that's measuring small amounts, not like just a food scale that does whole grams. Um, but again, you're probably not going to use this internally. If, I think when you use it externally, you can use a little bit larger of a dose. But again, I, I believe it causes some skin irritation, so you'll want to be careful of it. Name Bing Pian is interesting. It means ice slice. So again, this is like a white powder, so it looks kind of crystalline. It looks like ice, and so I think that's why it has that name. Uh, pian means a uh, slice, and so this is something that we'll see come up in herbs sometimes when you want your herbs to be sliced. So sometimes, I think we talked about this before, like when you're ordering Dongwei, if you get Dongwei To, that's the whole head of Dongwei, you probably want Dongwei Pian, the sliced Dongwei. So sometimes we'll see that come up in herbs. Sometimes we'll also see it come up in formulas where that same character, Pian, also means like pill or tablet. So um, sometimes instead of wan uh, for pill, it'll say pian as in tablet. So that's another Chinese word that we might see come up often. But bing pian, borneolum, good for both hot and closed disorder, or can be used topically for heat toxicity, carbuncles, sores, and boils. After that is Shichangpu, a Kori Tataranawi rhizoma. I just thought the, the Latin name was kind of funny. It sounds like tata for now. But sure. Chang Pu Akori Tataranawi Rhizoma. So this is the one that you might actually use in clinic because it's a plant part. Um, it has a normal dosage range, and we might use it for other less severe Shen problems than just delirium and coma. So this is one that you will, if you have a clinic herb room, this is something that they probably do have in your clinic, and this is something that we will see used in other types of formulas besides just reviving people from unconsciousness. So Shi Chang Pu, like the category, opens the orifices, and here we say quiets the spirit. So that's kind of a, an interesting thing that we're not talking about awakening the spirit, we're talking about quieting the spirit. So that kind of implies that we're using it for some of those more less severe Shen problems. And this is uh, especially for phlegm dampness blocking the sensory orifices, for things like deafness, tinnitus, forgetfulness, dulled senses, seizure, and stupor. So here we're talking about more that the physical orifices are blocked, not necessarily that you're delirious and you fainted, but just more that these sensory orifices are blocked. And we usually mean that they're being blocked by phlegm. So for Shi Changpu, I would think of phlegm. But besides just opening those orifices, it also transforms dampness and harmonizes the stomach for things like fullness in the chest and epigastrium, abdominal distension, dysentery, and inability to eat. So here when we say aromatic, we can mean a few different things. We can say aromatic, like we're talking about here, aromatic opening the heart orifices and awakening the spirit and reviving consciousness. We can talk about aromatic opening the sensory orifices, like kind of we talked about with things like Wuhe, Xinyi Hua, things like that, when like you have allergies and you feel like your eyes are itchy and your ears are blocked and um, you can use the aromatic quality to open up the orifices of the face. So we're doing that here as well. Or we can talk about aromatic as an aromatic awaken the spleen so that it can perform its function of transforming dampness. Shi Chang Pu does all of those things. So this one we might use in other situations as well, not just a closed disorder. So here we can say also used internally or topically for hoarse voice, B syndrome, abscesses, scabies, and lichen, and injury trauma. I mean, again, I'm not sure if I, I don't, I'm not sure I've seen it used very commonly for that, but that's something that is in the books. And then there also is this caution that avoid long-term use that is contains a, a essential oil, beta, Sorry, I don't remember it's off the top. Beta azerone. And this has the potential to be carcinogenic, I believe. And so this is something that we want to stay in the normal dosage range and don't use it long term. That if we use very large dosages, it does have this potentially bad ingredient that could cause problems. So um, it's something that different depending on where you source it and different species can have different levels, but to be safe, 
we want to stay within the normal dosage range and use it short term. So that's Shirchongpu. This is the one that you might actually use in clinic. This one, it has a normal dosage range. This one, it's a, it's a plant part. It's a root. So we boil it in decoction like normal. So that's Shirchongpu. I would remember phlegm misting the heart. Nyo Huang Bovis Calculus. Nyo Huang Bovis Calculus. This is cattle bezoar or the gallstone of a cow. So bovis is like bovine, it means cow. Calculus means stone. So this is cattle bezoar. This is like in Harry Potter. This is one of the first questions that Snape asked Harry about where would you look to find a bezoar? And he says in a goat's stomach. Here we're saying we're using the bezoar from a cow and I think it's really not in the stomach, it's in the gall. Actually, I don't know. I know, I know that um, cows are ruminants or they have multiple stomach tracts, so I'm not sure if it's actually, if they have a gall, but it's, a, it's part of a cow. Um, and this also comes up in the fifth book, which was, what was a Half-Blood Prince. Um, this also comes up when Ron gets poisoned. They use this as an antidote for poison. So I think this one, they didn't use it. He initially Ron uh, took a love potion that was very strong, and so you could we could think of that as being a Shen disturbance where it was very hard to get him to come to his senses. He was wandering off in weird directions. He wasn't paying attention. You had to snap your fingers to bring him back to his attention. So on the one hand, we could say that would be a type of Shen disturbance, but I think they they didn't actually use Bezor for that. I think it was after they cured him from his love potion, then he drank some mead that was poison, and so it's like. He started, he was convulsing, foaming at the mouth, and passing out. And so that's something we could say is a closed disorder. And there, uh, Harry had a bezoar on hand, and they used that to cure him from his poisoning. So that's maybe what we can think about here um, for Nyo Huang bezoar. So this one, we, it's specifically for a closed pattern due to phlegm. So we say it sweeps phlegm and opens the orifices. And here it's specifically for delirium or coma due to phlegm heat obstructing the heart orifices or warm heat diseases entering the pericardium. So this one is cool in temperature. It's bitter in flavor. It's specifically used for hot type clothes disorders, especially when there's phlegm. So things like also for a wind stroke convulsion and seizure. So besides using for that, it also clears liver heat and extinguishes wind. So. Um, I think I think it's the next category. We talk about substances that extinguish wind, and one of the causes of that can stir up internal wind is liver heat. When we have liver heat or liver yang rising, that that uh, those flames can start fanning wind. So we get things like spasm, tremor, convulsion with high fever due to heat entering the liver. It also clears heat toxicity, so painful and ulcerated swollen throat, mouth and tongue sores, abscesses, sores, and boils. So the point here is we're talking about clearing a lot of heat either heat as in phlegm heat blocking the heart orifices or these other symptoms of heat. This one also contraindicated during pregnancy. So that's Nyo Huang Bovis Calculus or cattle bezoar. Again, we're using a very small amount like 0.2 to 0.3 grams. Um, the Nyo, did I put it up here now? Nyo means ox or cow, like we learned this with like Nyo bangza or nyo shi means ox knees. So nyo means ox or cow and huang means yellow. Again, this is like a gallstone that comes from a cow. And so maybe the way I would remember this is you can think this has huang in the name. So think about the three huangs. When we talked about um, damp heat, we talked about Huang Qin, Huang Lian, Huang Bai, we call it the three Huangs. They're very good for clearing heat. They're some of our most bitter herbs. So maybe that can remind you that Nyo Huang is specifically good for hot type clothes disorders or clothes disorders due to phlegm heat. So for Nyo Huang, I would remember it's for heat disorders. And our final one here is Su He Xiang Styrax or liquid Styrax. Su He Xiang Styrax, or sometimes it's commonly referred to as liquid Styrax. Again, I believe this is some sort of, it's like a sap or a plant secretion. It comes from a plant, but it's a sap, and it's, um, this one I actually don't know if, if it's dried out and crystallized or if they use it in its liquid form. I think they have both. Anyway, Suhir Xiang opens the orifices, but this one is specifically for 
cold pattern close disorder. So when there's a cold pathogen blocking the heart orifices, interfering with that interface between the inside world and the outside, outside world. So Zhu Hushyang opens the orifice for cold pattern close disorders. It's also for windstroke or phlegm collapse, epidemic toxic diseases. Yeah. And it also uh, can relieve pain. So for cold pain with fullness and oppression in the chest and abdomen. So when we say relieving pain, again, it's for pain due to cold. Then we also say this can be applied topically for chillblain and frostbite. So um, I think Bensky just says chillblain. I think I've, I've seen in other books where they say frostbite. But chillblain, they're, they're similar. I think frostbite is you get so cold that your tissue starts to die, I assume is what frostbite means. Uh, chillblain is like when you're exposed to cold, it can actually cause some redness and swelling. It has some effect on the blood vessels that causes redness and swelling. So again, it's the type of pain due to cold, but it's... I, I assume this is like one step below frostbite. That first you would get this pain and swelling, and then eventually your your capillaries would burst and you would have frostbite. Look up chillblain on Wikipedia. It's it's uh, inflammation and stuff due to cold. But so again, this both of these in both of these things we're dealing with cold. So we're dealing with closed disorders or block patterns due to cold, or we're dealing with pain and problems in the extremities due to cold use cautions during pregnancy, and we will specifically say do not use for heat type uh, closed disorders or heat pattern block syndromes. So that's Su He Xiang. Again, we're using a very small dosage, 0.1 to 1 grams. And the name is kind of interesting. It means revive and join fragrance. So again, the term Xiang means aromatic or fragrant. So we saw this a little bit in this category. We also saw it in a lot in the regulate qi category, like mu xiang, chen xiang, tan xiang, xiang fu. We saw it in the aromatic category as well. Um, so the word xiang means aromatic. Interesting to remember, su means reviving. So this is the same character. If you remember back at the very beginning, I think it was the third herb that we learned was zitsuye, perilla folium. Zitsuye was a uh, purple reviving leaf. So that's the same su, that means to revive. He, I think we talked about this before with he huan pi in the, in the previous category, that he means joined or conjoined. And so su he xiang, revive and conjoin fragrance. So again, the xiang means it's aromatic, we're reviving the spirit due to its aromatic smell. So that's our category, aromatic substances that open the orifices. Again, it's a very small category. There's only a few herbs. Likely you'll never, you would never use very many of these herbs. Likely you don't have them in your clinic, but it's possible that you have Bing Pian and Shi Chong Pu in your clinic because those are the ones that are sometimes used. Um, a lot of these aren't on the NCCM list. I believe Shi Xiang and Su Shi Xiang are not there, but uh, Bing Pian is also not there, but I think Niu Huang, for some reason, is on that list. So, anyway, what I remember about these is uh, these first two, Shi Xiang and Bing Pian, we'll use them for both hot and cold type closed disorders, depending on the combination, which we'll see here. But for the last two, Niu Huang and Su He Xiang, Niu Huang specifically for hot type clo uh, closed disorders or other patterns of like heat toxicity or liver fire. And so maybe you can remember Huang is yellow, so it's like the three Huang, so it's good for clearing heat. Whereas Su He Xiang is specifically for cold patterns, closed disorders, or frostbite like you were exposed to cold. Shi Chang Pu, I would think about um, phlegm misting the heart orifices, but also it, its aromatic property also does affect the spleen as well. So we can use it for those digestive problems. So that's our category, aromatic substances that op open the orifices. And here we can take a brief minute to talk about some formulas, just because sometimes it's good to see how these are used in the context of, of other herbs and in, formula, in formulas, and then we can see uh, the kind of signs and symptoms that go along with them. But again, in terms of if you're studying for boards, these this category of formulas that open the orifices is not on NCCM board. So when I was in school, we still learned these formulas and they were part of our year-end clinic entrance exam. And so we had to know them 
kind of. But if you're studying for boards, it's po it's likely that you don't need to know these formulas. But we'll just take a look. at There's only a couple, so let's take a look at them anyway. So one is An An Gong Nyo Huang Wan. Calm the palace pill with cattle gallstone. An Gong Nyo Huang Wan. So An means calm or peaceful. This is one that a lot of it's like a it's the the character is a woman under a roof. A lot of people have this uh, on their wall because it means peace or calm and peaceful. Gong means palace, so sometimes we see that like Zugong, like we see that in various um, point names like fetal palace or purple palace. Anyway, uh, calm the palace, cattle, uh, cow yellow pill. Anyway. This is where a hot type closes sword. Like we said, Nyo Huang is for heat patterns. It has the Huang in the name. So it's it's yellow. It's like the three yellows. It's good for clearing heat. So this is specifically for a hot type closed disorder. So high fever, irritability and restlessness, delirious speech, impaired consciousness, sound of phlegm in the throat. When we said it's for hot type, we said it specifically for phlegm heat types. Dry mouth, also coma due to wind stroke. The tongue is red or scarlet. Scarlet is a very deep red, so there's a lot of heat there. The heat is entering the yin or shui levels. The pulse is rapid because of the heat. So here we have Nyo Huang, but then we also have some of those other Huangs as well, like Huang Lian and Huang Qin, because we're really trying to clear heat. So this is just an example of we're using Nyo Huang for a hot type clothes disorder. After that, we have Su He Xiang Wan, liquid Styrax pill. Su He Xiang Wan, liquid Styrax pill. And here, this is for closed disorder due to excess cold. So again, like we said, Nyo Huang better for heat patterns. Su He Xiang better for cold patterns. Here's an example of it using for closed disorder due to excess cold. So sudden collapse, loss of consciousness, uh, various signs like um, he says like abdominal pain and chest chest depression that are signs of an impending coma. Uh, pale cl pale complexion, purple lips, excessive mucus, cold extremities. The tongue is pale with a slippery, greasy coat. The pulse is deep, so we're we're talking about cold. It's kind of interesting here, like the formula is basically like they went through and found everything with xiang in the name and put it into one formula. So again, xiang means aromatic. So we're, we're just taking all the aromatic things and putting it in a formula. So su he xiang, shi xiang, an xi xiang, one we don't learn, mu xiang, tan xiang, qian xiang, which we learned from the uh, regulate qi category, ru xiang, which we learned from the invigorate blood category, ding xiang from war in the interior, xiang fu again from the, um, regulate chi category, bi ba from the warm. So we also have some warm the interior herbs as well because we're dealing with a cold pattern. So that's just kind of interesting that we put all the xiang herbs together in one formula. But what I would also point out here is um, one formula is for heat type closed disorders. One formula is for cold type closed disorders. So notice in both of these, we have shi xiang and bing pian. So shi xiang and bing pian are the more versatile ones. We can use them for heat or cold patterns, depending on the combination. So both of these have shi xiang and bing pian. But the one for heat has niu huang. So that's, that's why I think it's important to remember that niu huang is the one for heat patterns. Su He Xiang is the one for cold patterns. So that's how I would differentiate these two. If you're going to remember anything about these herbs, that's something I would remember. And then finally, we have a, a formula called Ding Jir Wan, Settle the Emotions Pill. Ding Jir Wan, Settle the Emotions Pill. This one is a formula that you might use. This formula is on the NCCM list. Um, but this one is for heart chi deficiency and constraint due to phlegm. So here we're not talking about... Um, loss of consciousness, delirium, impaired consciousness. Here we're talking more about that disquieted spirit. It's just that there's some um, some amount of phlegm causing constraint or phlegm misting the heart orifices. So feeling apprehensive, easily frightened, worried, disheartened, or incessant laughter and glee. Remember we said joy is the emotion of the heart. Uh, fright palpitations. So uh, fright is also, fear or fright is also the emotion of the heart, forgetfulness, dizziness. And so these are, these are less severe Shen problems.
Um, so here you can see we're using Renshen Fuling to tonify. Remember, Renshen tonifies all the qi, but it also tonifies heart qi as well. Fuling um, is in the drain dampness category, but it also tonifies the spleen. And we said it also does have some action of calming the spirit. Maybe if we wanted something better for calming the spirit, maybe we would switch to Fu Shen, because Fu Shen is good for the Shen, but Fu Ling also does calm the spirit. And here we have Shi Chang Pu and Yuan Zhi, which we, uh, Yuan Zhi we learned from the um, calm the spirit category. So this is actually a very common Dui Yao pair for phlegm misting the heart orifices. So if you remember back in our substances that calm the spirit category, or specifically our herbs that nourish the heart and calm the spirit category, we talked about Yuan Zhi, and there I kind of said that even though we put it in the category nourish the heart, it doesn't really have a sweet flavor. I don't think it has a very direct action of nourishing the heart, but it is very useful for phlegm misting the heart orifices. Same thing with Shi Chang Pu, it has a similar action. So we often use them together for phlegm misting the heart orifices. When, they're the, when there's this kind of veil over your sensory orifices, that veil is inner, it's, causing some problems with that interface between your internal environment and your external environment. So, so sometimes you get people who just, it's like they aren't quite there because there's a, a veil of phlegm. So I've had patients where like you ask them, you try to ask them questions and they give you an answer and it doesn't really make sense. Like, like I remember I had one patient that like we were trying to ask her what she did for work. Like, what is your job? What is your occupation? What are you do? What do you do for work? What is your job? And she was like, we have puppies, real ones. I'm like, that answer didn't make sense with the question that we asked. There's some sort of confusion there. And we would um, say that's something to do with the heart shen. And with her, it's possible there was some phlegm misting that. This can also mean that when you talk about information trying to come in through the senses and then get imprinted on your heart spirit, there could be, there could be some phlegm there that's interfering with with that process as well. So that's why we say forgetfulness. So I had one teacher who was really into this formula. If like students were trying to study, if they had problems remembering things, or if it was right before an exam and they wanted things in their brain, this was a formula he would recommend. And so it turns out um, Bensky even makes this note in his commentary where he says, if the heart spirit fails to focus on the tasks at hand, it cannot convert experience into memory, leading to forgetfulness. This may manifest as forgetting names or events, mixing up words, speaking words in the wrong order, or simply finding it difficult to commit anything to memory. And so uh, sometimes we say memory has something to do with the heart. Like we, we use this mnemonic that like, you know it by heart. And so that's kind of like your long, I believe that's your long-term memory and your short-term memory has to do with, anyway. So I think that's why he said that this, uh, he would recommend this for students who are trying to study. So sometimes I would make a joke that's like, if it's before your exams and you're trying to study, you could take Ding Jirwan. When it's after your exams and you're stressed out and you're crying and you have uh, uncontrolled emotions and crying after the exam, then you can take Gan uh, my dot satang, but uh, Ding Jirwan, sell the emotion spill. That's that's one of the applications he would emphasize. But again, I would just be careful about this Shi Chang Pu taking it long term. That it might have some carcinogenic things in it. So make sure you're careful about the dosage. And then taking it for a short while is probably okay. But taking it for years and years, maybe you would want to be careful about. So Ding Jirwan, settle the emotion spill, and that is our category aromatic substances that open the orifices. So again, this is one that we go over it for the for the sake of TCM theory, we go over it for historical pur purposes, but maybe it's unlikely that you would actually use these in a clinical application. Maybe even if you're studying for boards, not many of these, um, these herbs or these formulas show up on your NCCM boards. But if you are studying for boards, uh, we're getting towards the end of the semester, so whether you're studying for finals, for year ends, for clinic entrance exams, or for boards, if you're in that situation and you want to review all of the herbs in a very quick, efficient manner, make sure you check out the TCM Study Single Herb Review course, which is up now on Teachable. This, this is a, a paid course that just goes over very quickly all of the herbs that you'll need to know for finals, year ends, or boards. So if you're at, at that uh, 
point in your studies and you need to review, be sure to check that out. Otherwise, thanks for being here. Special thank you to the Patreon members for, for supporting the website, the YouTube channel, and everything we do here. But uh, thank you for your support. And uh, thanks for being here. We'll see you in the next one. We're getting towards the end. We only have a couple categories left. So after this, we have substances that um, extinguish wind and stop tremor. I was gonna, I was trying to say anchor so on. On the one hand, a lot of them anchor liver yang rising. And so I think a uh, wise man and brand actually call the category something different and rearrange. But in Bensky, he calls it uh, substances that extinguish wind and stop tremor. That's kind of our last major category. And then the week after that, we'll do something small about we have um, uh, herbs that expel parasites and substances for topical applications. So there's only like three herbs in each one. So we'll squish that into one category. So. Um, but anyway, stick around for next time when we go over substances that extinguish wind and stop tremor. But that's all for this one. We'll see you in the next one.